in our second service. We had an incredible time this morning, and we're glad you're here at our second service, and we just believe God has something to say to you through this worshipful experience and through the word today. I want you to turn with Pastor to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So glad to see so many of our, our guests here today. And if you're here for the very first time, raise your hand. Anybody? Amen. Anybody else here for the very first time? Right there. All right. God bless you. We are so glad that you are here. And if you, if you are still hanging out with us and not quite yet a member, we're grateful again that you're here. We are blessed uh, to have our sheriff with us today. Sheriff Forrester, so let's thank God for our sheriff and how he and his team and, of course, Chaplain Michael Wally, my dear friend, and we're glad to have them come to church when there's not an election going on. Amen. We want, we want those that carry authority to have Christ in their hearts. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4, even before he made the world, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I like this translation. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be what? Holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. You can't get to the Father but by, but by Christ. That is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So I want to talk today from this thought, the power of fellowship Created to belong. Created to belong. You may be seated in God's house. Last week, as we began this Pathways, we called it our sermon series, is Pathways from Providence to Purpose. We, we, we spent some time dealing with the first purpose for which you and I are still breathing, in our all-church study, and uh, to those that are, I guess we're in our all-church study for the next 40 days, we're fasting and we're studying and we're praying uh, for the next 40 days up into the resurrection weekend. Um, last week, we, 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 we came to the conclusion that, that the first purpose of which we are here is to worship. And uh, Minister Curry reminded us of that, that uh, worship is... For him, our focus, no matter what church you belong to or what faith or what denomination, what flavor of Christianity you are a part of, we worship him. We worship him. And our worship is for God, it is to God, and it's because of God. And so many people get mixed up in church because they feel like people say stuff like, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't enjoy worship today. And that's because our focus is not on who? God. If your focus is on God, then you can get something out of the worst sermon. You can get something out of the song you don't like when your focus is on who? God. It's on God. It's not on me. It's not on my proclivities. It's not on, you know, my little idiosyncrasies. It's all about him. And so I don't get caught up in the music. or I don't get caught up in whether they got red pews or blue pews. I don't get caught up if they have stained glass windows or if they don't have any windows. I, I have come to worship God. So today I want to deal with the second purpose for which you and I are still breathing. And that purpose is fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. fellowship. Our purpose for being together is that we might fellowship. In a few minutes, we're going to be introducing you to our team that's going to Ghana in July. 
And what I love about our Ghana team, and, 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 and Doc will give you more, um, more um, I should say, specificity on who's part of the team, but they're from cross churches, they're from cross uh, ethnicities, because the Church of Jesus Christ is, is, is one entity, right? And it doesn't matter uh, if you're uh, east side, west side, south, it doesn't matter. We are to be in fellowship with one another. Fellowship. When I think about fellowship, I'm reminded of in my boyhood days, I used to love when Daddy would put us all, it was five of us, and uh, five, I was the oldest, and he put us all in the back seat of, uh, of his Buick, and he would take us to Grandma's house. Uh, amen. All five of us, we piled back, and every time Daddy turned the corner, whoever was on the end go, get off of me, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, because we, <laughs> we're all on top of each other. But we were going to Grandmama's house, and there was something about going to Grandmama's house that reminded me of what I want to share with you today. And that is that when we go to Grandma's house, uh, she would be cooking up everything she could find, and, and she would be in that kitchen, and she'd be so happy. Grandma would be singing Amazing Grace uh, or one of her other favorite Christian songs, and she'd be stirring those pots and getting those Amen. All that food ready for us. And she was ecstatic. She was happy because it gave her great joy to see all of her grandchildren eating from her table. She loved it when we ate all of her homemade biscuits and all of that gravy she would put together, a little of this and a little of that, a little something over here, you know how grandma could do it. And she would get so, and sometimes she, she was so full of the fellowship of her grandchildren that she didn't eat a lot of times. That's how wonderful it was to grandma. And I thought about that. That's the way God is when it comes to our fellowship and our worship. God has prepared the table for us with all the trappings, with his amazing benefits with his amazing blessings. And last week, we looked at some of those blessings, but, but God has just set the table. And sometimes he sets the table in the presence of our enemies. And our blessings just keep overflowing. And amen, the plate is just overflowing. And God gets great joy when we come to worship him and feed off of his presence. He gets great joy when there's a reciprocity between how he has blessed us and how we respond to his blessings. You see, you and I were made for fellowship. The fifth verse of that first chapter in Ephesians says, God decided in advance. I love that. Before he created anything, he decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. God had a family in the very beginning. It was called the Trinity. He created us to become a part of that family. And he created us not and gave us differences, not to divide us, but to make us all part of his family. And I shared this morning, God was not lonely when he made man. He already had the presence of the Son and the Holy Spirit with him. He was not lonely. He, he was not by himself. He, he does not need me or you. He has chosen to include me in his family through his Son, Jesus Christ. He's chosen to do that. Before he created the sun and the moon, the stars and the skies, before he created green grass and the oceans, before he separated the land from the sky, he, he thought of you. He had you in mind. That's why I am very saddened, and I'm going to say this. I didn't say it this morning. I'm going to say it here. When people have abortions. Because God saw that child before that child was even created. Wow. 
And so, and yet I'm on the other side of the fence that I'm, I'm getting political now. I don't think you should dictate to someone how they should handle their body either. So I'm schizophrenic when it comes to that issue. <laughs> but, I, but, I'm, but I'm biblical in that thou shall not what? Kill. Wow. So, boy, that's a, that's a tough one. I'll, I'll get some text back messages on that one, I'm sure. And good, ask me all the questions you need to because I love you to ask questions. But God created us with fellowship on his mind. He created the entire universe because he wanted more family. Amen? He had family, but he said, I want more family. And I like diversity. And I, I, I like creativity. So I want the more the better. And that's the way grandma was. The more children showed up, the happier she was. And the more of us come to worship service, the happy your God is. Why? Because he craves fellowship with you, with me. Amen. Fellowship is essential for mankind and especially for the believer. It is an essential part of who we are. In 1773, a young pastor was pastoring a poor church and uh, he was a great preacher, a great teacher, and his skills were known throughout the area. And so, consequently, a powerful, uh, influential church called him to become their pastor. They called him from the poor little church to come to the affluent church. And they tell me in 1773 that they were packing his wagons and putting his few belongings in the wagon, and, and uh, the, the members of the church had come were tearful with a tearful goodbye. They'd come to wish their pastor uh, much success. And while they came one after another, hugging their pastor and saying farewell, during the goodbyes, his wife, Mary, said to her husband, John, I cannot bear to leave these folk. And he looked at her with tears in his eyes. He said, I can't either. He said, you know what? We're going to remain here. The wagons were unloaded. John Fawcett spent his entire 55 years of ministry in that little church, all because of the depth of fellowship that he and his wife experienced. But he wrote a beautiful hymn. As a result of that experience, and we sing it. I used to sing it when I was a little boy at the close of every service. Every Sunday, my choir and the pastor would lead us into this hymn. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. That's where that hymn came from. From a pastor who turned down what, he, what looked like an affluent job and stayed where God wanted him. Why? Because the fellowship was great. The gospel message of fellowship is indicative by studying the cross. When you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, you notice there's a vertical bar, right? And the vertical bar is, symbol, is, is symbolic of our fellowship with God the Father, right? That our fellowship to him is upward. It's on a vertical plane. But there's another part of that cross, which is on the what? Horizontal plane. And that is the fellowship that we should have one with another. And we can't say, well, I'm not worried about the horizontal plane because I don't like those folk. I'm just going to concentrate on the vertical plane, right? We can't do that because the vertical plane fellowship is impacted by how we operate on the what? Horizontal plane. And that's why I, as your pastor, I try to go across racial lines. I try to go across denominational lines because it's important as a believer that we not only manifest ourselves and major in our vertical relationship with God, but God looks at us and say, how are you doing with your 
brother. And the great scripture is 1 John 4 and 20. Verse, uh, 1 John 4 and 20. Let's, let's look at that scripture. It says this. It says, whoever claims to love God, yet hate a brother or sister, is a what? Is a what? Go on and say it. A what? Is a liar. For whoever does not love their what? And what? Whom they what? Whom they're looking at and what? And can, can I love God? Why? Because, whom they have not what? Seen. You can't say I love God and you've never seen God, but you can't get along with your brother. Amen? Because we have to major not only in the vertical relationships, but also in the horizontal relationships. And that means we ought to be in fellowship one with another. That word fellowship comes from a Greek word called koinonia. Koinonia. It means or cornea. It, it, it's according to how you want to pronounce it. Or cornea, however you want to pronounce that. But that word is pronounced different ways. And, and, but it means fellowship. It means, it, it, it means the coming together. And that is why we are encouraging you to consider making sure that not only do you attend New Era Church, but that you are part of a smaller setting, a small group, a group of believers that, that you can get involved with that will help you. Because, see, I was sharing this morning, I can't see everybody uh, that, that come to church on a given Sunday. Uh, your rhythms are different than when I went to church. I went to church every Sunday. But your rhythm is a little different today. Amen. Some of y'all come to church two or three times a year. I mean a month. Um, uh, <laughs> Y'all know who you are. <laughs> and if you wake up on time, you come to a 9 o'clock service. If you sleep in, you say, oh, Lord, I guess I'll go to the second service. And so, it's, you know, so the rhythms are so different, and that's good. We, 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 that's why we have both services, so you can have an opportunity. But it is important that you find a smaller group, a segment of our larger group, so you can feel like you are connected. Most people need that kind of environment. And you're that way in your secular walk. I mean, when you think about where you were, that's a small group of people that you know well, better than the others. Um, some of you are in social clubs, right? Uh, sororities and fraternities. Uh, some of you are Masons and all those other kind of small groups. You, you golf together. Uh, you have a golfing team or you're on a baseball team or a basketball team. Or, you know, uh, you know we have our, our sheriff here today and there's a, there's a group of them that hang together. And so we, we're all family, right? Uh, but we have those small segments that we, that we feel comfortable in. I encourage everyone here to get in a small group when it comes to the spiritual body. Because that's the most important group you could ever be a part of. Amen? Being in fellowship with like-minded believers, people who love God like you do. And oftentimes when I get ready to go visit somebody in the hospital or I hear of something happening to one of you, most likely your small group has already been there. And the pastor never shows up. Your small group will show up to make sure that they're there for you. That's the power of being in fellowship in a smaller setting. I love what Rick Warren said. He says, we should not be lone wolves. You know, there's no, no lone wolf. We, we ought to be in fellowship one with another. Someone once said, and we don't know who said this, but it's a great quote, that the real menace to life in this world today is not nuclear war. It's not crime. The real menace to life in this world today is not nuclear war or crime. They are bad, but they're not the real menace. The real menace is the fact of, write this down, the fact of proximity without community. Here it is. The fact of proximity without community. To be in, in a place of proximity and never really becoming a part of the community. Sitting, sitting on the same row with people you've never stopped and said, hi, I'm Clarence. What is your name? I know you go to New Era, but, but I don't know your name. And we, that, that's one of the tragedies of the church of Jesus Christ. And I think 
we see it all the way. Bruce Lawson said this, and I like it even more. It's more real. It's more comprehensive in terms of illustrating fellowship. He says this. He says the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit that there is when it comes to fellowship. He says this. It's an imitation dispensing liquor instead of grace. It's an escape rather than reality. But it is an accepting and inclusive fellowship. The local bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics. That's not why people go there necessarily. But because God has put into them in a human desire to be in something larger than themselves. To belong. Everybody say to belong. To, belong. to be known. To, to be loved. To, to, to somebody knows my name. So, so we see this counterfeit fellowship at the price of a few beers. Uh, Y'all mighty quiet out there right now. So, somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, for the other person. It's not you. It's not the other person. The reason so many young people are in gangs, men and women, is not be so much because they're, they're criminals, but they, they, they're part of something that they are in what? Fellowship. They're trying to belong. And if you don't offer an alternative for these kids, they're getting into a situation where they belong, but it may not be the most... Um, healthy environment for them. But that's why you see a lot of them getting in situations because they're trying to belong. And that is why God designed the local church. It should be the main place where we do life. No matter what you do, no matter what career you have, no matter what your title is, the main place that you do life should be in a community of people that are trying to live out their faith. That should be the main community where you do life. And David said it like this in Psalms 133. He says, behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to what? Dwell together in unity. That's, what, it's, that's the beautiful thing. To see men and women in all their differences, coming together, doing things together in what? Unity. Because the church is the place that God wants to be your greatest fellowship hub. I got a Facebook post this week. I want to read it to you. It says, for the last year or so, I've been struggling with my faith in God. I've allowed the circumstances of this life, multiple deaths in my family, especially my grandfather's passing, to shake me. But this past Sunday, my faith was restored. Watching and listening to my pastor, Clarence C. Moore, with tears in his eyes, boldly confessing his own faith in God, brought me back to the place where I first believed, which happened to be at Northside New Era or New Era Church. My earliest memory is falling asleep in the pew as a little girl, looking up at those stained glass windows as the choir sang and my pastor's voice booming, echoing throughout the sanctuary like thunder as he preached. That memory seemed so insignificant as I got older and as I went through life. This life throws some serious blows. And sometimes it makes us question everything, but everything, everything, but everything. But through all the pain and the grief, I've had to reach way down deep and simply say, yes, God, I still believe and I still choose you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that reconnection, that re-belonging, took place at the church, not the local bar, you're right, not, not at the bowling alley, not the pool hall, but that, that reconnection of what really matters in life took place when she came back, sat in church. We all need to belong to a fellowship. Ephesians 2 
and 19. I want to read that to you, Ephesians 2 and 19. It says, so now you are no longer visitors or strangers. Now you are citizens together with God's holy people. My version says, and you belong to God's family. You used to be a stranger. You used to just be a visitor. You used to be outside. You were at church but not in church. But now that you have given your heart to Christ, you are no longer a stranger. You are now a friend of God. You belong to God's family. You have been called out. That's what that Greek word to church means, ecclesia, the called out one. We have been called out from the world. Now, we are in the world, but we're not what? Of the world. We are in the world, but we're not what? Of the world. I go to the beach, and I get in the ocean, but I'm not what? Of the ocean. Amen? And when you take anything out of this environment that is essential to their lifehood, then it's going to die. So if you left me in the ocean with no oxygen, I won't live. If you take a fish out of the ocean without water, it's what? Not going to live. So we are in the world, but we're not what? Of the world. Stop acting like you are of the world just because you are you are in the world not of the world but we're supposed to go back to the world to bring other folk out of the world amen, amen. amen. so if you go around folk and you acting like you of the world you never get them out of the world So we are called out from the world. The church, capital C, is not an event. It's not a program. This spiritual church I'm talking about is not something you go to. It's not a location. This church, capital C, is something you belong to. To. You were created to belong to this spiritual body. That's why you join the local church, but you have to be born into the universal church. And once you are born into the universal church, then you find a local church where you can belong and grow, worship and fellowship. Amen? Church is a relationship. That's where we take care of one another. John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. And again, I'll send you my sermon. If, if, you, if, these, if you don't have these verses in front of you, I'd be glad to share this, this document with you that I've written uh, John 13, 34 through 35 says, Jesus said this, a new commandment I give you. I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another. How about that? That you what? Love one another. Everybody say one another. One another. And even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my family. If you love one another, if you have love for another, all of these, there are many verses that talk about one another, one another, one another. But this verse encapsulates the meaning of what that means. It means there ought to be love in our hearts for all of God's family. And God's family has many branches. Amen. I got cousins over here, right? And I got uncles and aunts over there. 
They're not all in my locality, but they may be in different denominations. They may be in different churches, but we're all one one. And one day there's going to be a big family reunion. We're going to all come together. I uh, had the privilege this past week, I was the guest preacher, speaker for, teacher for uh, my home church up in Kokomo. When I, uh, when I left college, uh, I took a job up in Kokomo, Indiana. I thought that was going to be my career. I was going to be a big man and get way up, go up the ladder and General Motors and all that. But what God was doing, he was getting me in position in Indiana because he really had you in mind. He had us in mind. And uh, when I look back at it, you know, his hand was orchestrating things. But anyway, I had a chance to go back. I haven't been, haven't been back there. I spent the kind of time I spent this week in 30 years. 30 years. I've been your pastor almost 30 years. Um, and so uh, I noticed each night the crowd kept growing. And uh, if I was dumb, I would think that it was because I'm such a great preacher and such a great teacher. But Mike, that really wasn't why. That was part of it. But that wasn't really the real reason why. He that tooteth not his own horn, may horn may never get tooted, right? <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so that was part of it, right? They, they came, but they were coming back to see the homeboy. That's what they were doing. They were coming back to see their homeboy. Because 30 years ago when I left, we had such a fellowship. We, we, we really loved one another. And, and, and a lot of the people that were there 30 years later, their parents have gone on to glory, and they were children when I came along as a young man. And now, 30 years later, they got their own children. But they just kept coming and kept coming. And it was because of a fellowship, a koinia, that had taken place some 30 years ago that made them want to come and be a part of what was going on there. And that's what happens when you are developing great fellowships with those in life. They never die. Christ loved his church, and he wants us to be in fellowship one with another. You see, he created the church to, to really meet our deepest needs. Somebody say deepest. Then the church can't meet all your needs, but your deepest need, your deepest need, singular, the church is designed to meet. It is a need that your family can't meet, no matter how great your family is or what your family name is. That need, the family can't meet. That need, your job can't meet. The government can't meet that need. Your social circles can't meet that need. See, the only, the only one that can meet your deepest need, and that is, that is to be reconnected back to your creator, Amen. is the church. Because it's the only relationship that is eternal. In, 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 in 20 years, there'll be another pastor preaching here, right? In a few years, there'll be another sheriff. Where you work, Give it a few decades, you won't be there. Or a few weeks, or maybe months. <laughs> okay, years. But the only relationship you have, the only one you have is the relationship where you belong in fellowship with God. It's the only one that's eternal. Amen? Amen. That is so true. And so, and so since the church can... Can, can meet our deepest need, we need to belong to that entity. Oftentimes when Paul was trying to describe the church, he would use metaphors. You know, a metaphor is an implied likeness. It's, it's comparing something over here to something over there. And the way we use metaphors, we would say, uh, uh, he runs like a deer, right? Or... What's another metaphor? Um, she, she's smart as Einstein. You know, th th those are metaphors. We, we, it's an implied likeness. If I said he's strong as an ox, you know he's not an ox, but that means he's strong like a what? Like an ox. And so what Jesus did and, 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 and Paul did through Christ was, uh, Christ through Paul, was to try to describe the church 
through metaphors. And when you study these metaphors, we begin to see why only the church can meet our deepest need. I want to look at some metaphors right quick. Paul said, oh, okay, let me see. He said, how can I explain the church? Okay. He said the church is a family. Everybody say family. family. We know what a family looks like, right? He said, okay, let me give you another metaphor. Okay, a church is a building. Everybody say building. building. We know a building. It, it, it's, it's, it's only good if it's stable and it's, if, it's, you know, if the structure is, has stability and, and it has protection, right, and it has covering. And so he said, when you think about the church, think about a building. Then he said, okay, let me give you another one. Oh, I know. The church is a body. The church is a body. Everybody knows what a body looks like. Okay, and, and, and I'm going to just do one more. He said the church is like a garden. A garden. A family, a building, a body, a garden. And when you study each of these metaphors, you have the profound implications of what it offers to your life. If you understand the meaning of these metaphors, you begin to see the purpose for which and why you're breathing and why you should be a part of a church. You understand how the church is designed for fellowship to meet your deepest need in life. All this time you thought money was your deepest need. You thought sex was your deepest need. No, your deepest need is an intimacy with God. So let's look at these four metaphors, and then pastor is going to take a seat. When you think about these metaphors, Paul says that the purpose for the fellowship or the family of, called the church is to learn my true identity. That, that is the true purpose, is to learn my what? My true identity. Well, how do you learn your true identity? Through family. Your family. Your family tell you who grandmama and them were. Your family tells you where you came from and how your, your great, great, great granddaddy came from here or there. It's your family that, that helps identify your true identity. But I'm not talking about that kind of identity. When it comes to the fellowship of the church, when you really know your true identity, you got to understand that you only get that from being in fellowship with the church. You can't learn it from the world. You can't learn it from your peers or anybody else. This true identity, that the one that's eternal I told you about earlier, it can only come from being a part of this incredible fellowship called the church. That's why we ask the question in our study, what on earth am I here for? There's some nights you wonder, why, why, God, why am I here? Uh, even the best ask that question. Isaiah asked that question. Elijah asked that question. John the Baptist asked that question. Why am I here? Things are going so bad, I just don't know why I'm here. And we know that the answer to that comes only through fellowship with God. Because we often get sidetracked, and the world makes us think that we're here, and, and we, so we, we have to wear certain things to, to kind of define who we are, right? And so we put labels on. We, we wear other men's jerseys. You know, as, uh, yeah, I, I used to, I had a, I had a, um, um, a Peyton Manning jersey. I'm walking around as Clarence Seymour with Peyton Manning on my back. <laughs> uh, because we want to identify with what? With greatness. Some of you have LeBron James, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have those things. My, my grandson came decked out the last time I saw him. He had on LeBron James shoes, LeBron, Shane, uh, LeBron James jersey, and uh, it was all Laker gear. All Laker gear. Amazing. Uh, because we want to, if we're not careful, the world will tell us our identity is in Nike or in Adidas or in Calvin Klein or in Gucci, right? Or Ashley Stewart or uh, what's some others? Uh, Kate Spade, um, you name it. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor, right? Uh, huh, yeah, and, and, uh, or Apple, you know, or Apple or iPhone or and all these things we have, they, you know, or Cadillac or BMW or Jaguar. We, 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 all we, we just, we just, all we all are just walking uh, uh, billboards for somebody else getting all the money. Yeah. 
But that's, that's, and so we get caught, we think our identity is through that stuff. I came by today to tell you, your true identity is not in those things. Your true identity is in relation with, relationship to who? God and fellowship to God through your local church because it will last forever. Here's the second thing I want you to put down. We said that, that so sometimes when, when we try to describe the church, we say the church is a building. But here's your second reason you ought to belong to a local church is you get support. You support. A building is something that supports us. Below us is a lower level. We're all sitting on the second level because there is support. There is a foundation there that allows us to sit in the upper room, right? And so that's the way it is in the ministry. That's the way it is in church. The church offers a support system, a covering system, a mechanism where we can come in out of the world and be safe. I remember when Sheriff Donald Hayes was going through a difficult time in her life, and oftentimes Donald would come to the church, ring the doorbell, we let her in. She walked past everybody, wouldn't say anything. She walking up the steps, she come, and I come follow Donald, and she's at the altar. Because this is where she got her strength. This is where she comes. She comes for day after day. She would come to the altar. And some of you do the same thing because this is a safe place. This is the place where you feel the comfort and the presence of God. Amen. What happens when there's a major dis uh, disaster? Everybody goes where? Go to, they don't go to the mall. <laughs> then where do they come usually? They come to a church where they, they can hold everybody, and they sit there, and they look at the cross, and they cry, and they ask questions like, why God? But that's where they get their hope, their support, right? So the local church, this fellowship, not only is where you get your true identity, but it's where you get really genuine support. The third thing that I wanted to share with you is that when you look at the metaphor of a body, the scripture says that the church is the body of Christ. And so when you start thinking about the body, the church is the place where you get your or my unique value. I, I'm uniquely, I'm, I'm not, I'm not James Wells. James Wells is not Clarence Moore. James Wells is not Greg Byers. Greg Byers is not James Wells. We are uniquely created for a unique purpose. So the church is a unique place. I want to read a scripture to you. Uh, it's in, it's in uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. It talks about the uniqueness of the body of Christ. It says for each, I'm going to go to verse 4, uh, Romans 12 and 4. For just as each of us has one body, somebody say one. We have many what? Many members. And these members do not all what? Have the same what? Function, right? So in Christ we, through though many, form what? One body. And each member belongs to what? All the others. Each member belongs to all the others. We are one body, right? And so I'm glad that all of us don't come to church to be the hand. We need some eyes. We need some ears, right? We need some feet. We need some knees. We, in order for the body to function, everybody has to do its part. And so, and so Paul says, when you think about the church, we are the body. We are in fellowship with one another. And every time my foot gets out of fellowship with my brain, I'm going to fall. Huh? So I don't want my foot to be my brain. I don't want my brain to be my foot. I need all of me for me to be healthy and for me to move to the places and things God has called me to. You are unique. Stop trying to be like someone else. Be you. Look at somebody and say, be you. You are the best model of you. Nobody else can be you. God has uniquely made you. And so many people look in the mirror and they say, boy, why do I look like this? Why, why, why is this me? But you have to realize, amen. 
Amen. We have, you have to realize that, that, that you are just as beautiful and just as important to God as anyone else. Amen. Amen. Because you are unique in value. You are uniquely valued by God. I was sharing earlier that have you ever done, uh, had a, bought a 500-piece uh, jigsaw puzzle and you put it all together and you're missing one piece? Do you say, oh, well, that's okay, I'm going to go. No, you be going, like, oh, man, I just, it just doesn't look like it's complete, right? And then you start looking for that what? One piece. And that's what Jesus said. He said, I'll leave the 99 because there's a missing piece of my puzzle. There's a family member that's not quite yet in the family reunion. And so he said, I'm going to put New Era Church and many other churches in the world so they can go and get the rest of my family because I got some missing pieces of the puzzle. And until I get every piece, I'm not going to feel complete. It ain't going to look right with a piece missing in the middle of the puzzle. And you could be that missing piece that God is waiting on. You have, and you can't, you know, I, I know you all have done puzzles before. You ever tried to make something work like, and get in. It looks like it fits. It ought to fit. You'd be pushing. <laughs> no, it's unique. It, it doesn't fit there. It fits over here. You're trying to make it work over there. Right? So you have to be you. Get in your place. The church gets in so much trouble when people don't know their role. Know your role, do your role, stay in your lane. I like that one commercial. You know, where he, the guy's the tattoo guy. He, the guy, no. I, I don't agree with that altogether, but the picture the guy said, hey, man, stay in your lane. I would have got out of that. I would have took my arm back and got out of there. But, but my point is, you are you, and you are unique to us. We need you. Amen? Okay. Well, let's go to my last one. I'm almost finished. Here it is. I, I've told you that the reason you're in fellowship with God is that you can learn your true identity, the real reason you're on this earth. And you can also, as I've taught you, that this is where you get your real support system. Um, and then secondly, uh, this is also where you are uniquely valued because uh, you're a part of God's family. You are unique. Uh, I love that. You know, there, we go to the family reunion. It's amazing. We always have that one uncle that is so unique. <laughs> Y'all got an uncle like mine <laughs> But we look forward to him showing up, right? The, the, the family reunion ain't complete until Uncle Bud shows up. <laughs> Here's the last thing. He, he equates, he says, a metaphorical illustration of the church is a garden. Oh, a garden. And what he's saying there, he's saying is that we should be productive. One of the reasons he puts us in the fellowship is that we will become productive. That what we do in life will make a difference and it will be lasting. And so he begins to give this illustration in John chapter 15. But he begins to talk about the association of the branch to the vine. And he says this. He says, remain in me and I will what? I'll remain in you. For as a branch cannot produce fruit, right, right, it, it cannot produce fruit if it is what? Severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain, somebody say remain, remain. somebody say remain. remain, in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the what? You Don't get it twisted, you're not the vine, you're the what? Branch. You are the branch. All right, And he goes on to say that those who remain in me and I in them, they produce what? Much fruit. Not just little fruit, but what? Much fruit. And so the key to 
uh, you belonging to a fellowship and New Era Church being one is that you will live a productive life for Christ. And if you try to, I don't care who you are, how smart you are, how many people know your name, how much money you have. I know a lot of people, people that are very famous, but they are so, so sad. They're so depressed. Reach all the way to the top, and then you never see them smiling. Because they have worked, watch this. I love this illustration. I think it was out of uh, uh, Richard Blackaby, that you have built this ladder of success and got all the way to the top and realized you were building against the wrong wall. All this time, you were working meticulously, committedly, and got to the very top, looked over, and realized, oh, my God, I did all of this building against the what? The wrong wall. I don't want that to happen. I want you to look back when you build your ladder, and you look back, I want you to realize that, man, when you look over at where you are and how you've come to where you are, hallelujah, amen, that you would say, I have lived a productive life. <laughs> hallelujah. I have lived a what? A productive life. Tomorrow, about this time, there will be a 96-year-old beautiful woman lying right here. I'll be standing over her tomorrow, sharing with the family as they get ready to bury her remains. But you know what? Those 96 years seem like a lot to us, but they mean nothing to eternity, to where she's headed. Amen? And most of us won't see 96. So don't blow 40, 50, 60, 70 years on this earth, maybe 80. Don't blow it and miss out on eternity. I want you to belong. I want you to belong. Let's stand. Pastor's finished. I want you to get connected. I want you to belong. And remember, your true identity comes with your relationship and fellowship with God. Your support comes from your support from your relationship with God. Remember that your productivity comes from being in the environment with God. And remember that you are uniquely valued. No one like you. Father, we thank you.